What's going on, everybody? It is Treeb from Treeb Talks here, and this video is going to come out a little bit later in the week, but it's the return of a video podcast that me and my boy put together a long time ago, and I was re-watching them, and I thought it was a good concept, and we need to keep it going. And in that same video, I called Lamar Jackson a bust. Anyway, we're not going to talk about that. Jason's in the building. How you doing, bro? Hey, man. What's up? Uh, not much. Just had a busy day today. Um, it's hot as hell in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, so. I can't relate, dude. In Idaho, it's been raining, and it's just been – it's been treacherous outside. I, I, I just nothing compared to, to Florida rain, I'm yeah. sure. I want it to rain so bad here. Like, I want it to be like a monsoon here because <laughs> it's so ridiculously dry and hot. It's humid, so it's not necessarily dry, but it's just like you go outside and it's just like you have no air to breathe. It's so ridiculous. Like it's, my car doesn't have AC right now, so I'm working to fix that. And I, have, I drive a black Camry with <laughs> windows. So I go in there and I feel like I'm in a sweatshop. It's ridiculous. Is it funny that that's exactly what I thought you'd drive? No. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I guess it is kind of funny, but like but most people think I drive like a freaking like – like a Lexus or something like I, people I always ask people like what they think I drive and they're just like oh you probably drive like a Prius or some shit or a Lexus or something nice I'm just like nope got a crappy old 97 Camry my, my first car you know I can't, I can't let go of it it's too sentimental for me that's how it was with my uh my Mazda 626 and then I wrecked it and I still have the steering wheel like every place I've moved in Idaho I hang the steering wheel outside my house just for in its memory yeah I feel that for sure. I, yeah, same same with my car. I'm gonna probably cry when I go let the car. But my dream car is a Tesla. Can't wait to get that. Everybody's wanting a Tesla. But anyway, this is the Jags Week in Review, and like I said, this came out a little late, um, partially because your boy just kind of got you know a little bit amped up, got a little extra ambitious, and I wanted to get back on that YouTube grind. Shout out to. Um, I think they're called Jaguars United now, but another Jags podcast. I'm obviously close with those guys. Uh, seeing them do so well kind of motivated me to get back on my grind. So shout out to those guys. And um, first of all, we're going to be talking about the NFL draft. Now, overall, Jason, what were your thoughts about the, uh, was it 12 or 14 selections that the Jaguars made in the 2020 draft? Um, well, I think you're going to like what I have to say because when we drafted uh, Jake Luton from Oregon State, I saw a quarterback on the board that wasn't even drafted, and you're actually very familiar with him, and I was super high on him, super high on him. I watched a lot of film on him. I watched a lot of people who talked about him. You already know who I'm about to say. Yeah, I, Jordan. I think that he is such a phenomenal quarterback. He has a lot of room to grow, but taking, taking Jake Luton at, you know, in the sixth round is just – abysmal when if, you, if, you, if you're going to take a quarterback at all and there's you know Anthony Gordon I think I called him Aaron Gordon but Anthony Gordon if he's on the board why don't you take him you know like same school as Gardner Minshew it makes sense same system he kind of, Gardner Minshew you know was a sixth round pick last year you know why don't we take another sixth round rookie out of Washington State who came out of the same exact Mike Leach air raid system he's sitting there Jake Luton I looked at I, I looked at his film i seeing missing passes and missing throws all over the field. And it's just like, why, why do you, why do you take, why, why do you take Jake Luton from Oregon State? What do you see in him? Because when I was watching him and evaluating him, I just didn't really see much. I thought he was going to go undrafted when I was doing my numerous mock drafts months ago. I was just like, there's no, I don't even know who this Jake Luton kid is. I watched film on probably 200 to 300 prospects coming in the NFL draft. And I just don't, it doesn't make sense to me. What do you think? Um, I wasn't a fan of that pick, and you know, none, not a whole lot of people were. You read any of the overall draft grades from the Jaguars draft class, and they were not high on the uh, Oregon State quarterback. And you know, you take you talk about a guy like Anthony Gordon, who did come out of the same system as uh, Gardner Minshew. In fact, you know, they played in the same conference, both Pac-12 quarterbacks. And you know, Anthony Gordon is a dog. I've seen him. Li- I've seen him live. Uh, the game when I went and met Gardner Minshew was that quadruple overtime game against UCLA where he threw nine or 10 touchdowns. And, and he's a fun, he's a fun quarterback to watch, but I mean, I think when you compare the likeness of Gardner Minshew to Anthony Gordon, I don't really see it there. I think Anthony Gordon, I didn't think he was going to go undrafted. I think Seattle's a good fit for him. I think with the coaching staff they have down there, they're going to kind of groom him to be, a successful NFL backup at the very least. But, you know, Minshew came into Washington State with, like, a whole different 
set of, you know, where he's been through, what he's done, everything like that. I don't think Anthony Gordon really has that high of a ceiling that Minshew did, but um, Gordo definitely uh, deserved to get drafted over Lutton, that's for sure. And I think at this point, the Jags had already made double-digit picks. You know, you're not going to be happy with every single one that they make. And yep. getting the six-round quarterback has been kind of a tradition for the Jaguars recently, getting Minshew, Tanner Lee. Um, this one definitely uh, rings more of a Tanner Lee vibe than a Minshew vibe, though. No, absolutely no doubt. Um, the other picks, I was really happy with them, in all honesty. First round pick, C.J. Henderson, I wasn't super happy about it. I feel like we could have went somewhere else and a bigger team, uh, a bigger, a bigger uh, you know, position of need. But after watching uh, C.J. Henderson over again after the after the uh, initial selection, I was pretty happy with what I saw. Um, I'm not I'm not a big fan of drafting Florida prospects. There's a lot of Florida prospects that you know, you know, nationally don't work out. They don't work out at all. But Watching C.J. Henderson reminds me a lot of Jalen Ramsey when he played for FSU, and I don't think he's going to live up to that, like, you know, like the hype that Jalen Ramsey set the, the few years that he was here because arguably one of the best cornerbacks in the entire NFL before he went to the Rams. I think he had, like – he I feel like he actually did have a back injury. I feel like he might have played it off a little bit to not play, but there was obvious – you know, there was obvious difference from when, you know, Jalen Ramsey – you know, 2018, 2017 to, you know, 2019, 2020 season when it came, when he came with the Rams. So I, I saw a lot of uh, similarities with C.J. Henderson. I was really big. I was really happy after a little while of thinking about it and pondering it. C.J. Henderson is a dog. He's going to lock up your number one receiver nine times out of ten. And I'm super excited to see what he does in training camp. Like I said, Florida prospects scare the hell out of me because the last Florida prospect that we took around that, around that time, we already know his name, Dante Fowler. Scares the hell out of me. You got to watch him in practice because you can't have another scare like that. You can't have another Dante Fowler incident come to training camp. We need him. He's a you know number nine overlock selection. Have to make sure that he stays on the field and produces. And you know we have to make sure Todd Wash puts him in positions to succeed because if he doesn't, he's not going to last very long. He needs the development of a good defensive coordinator, and I just don't think Todd Wash is that. So C.J. Henderson was the uh, ninth overall pick, the first of the Jaguars' first-round picks. And I recorded my instant reaction. They were actually making the pick when I was on my way home from work. And I had a similar reaction to you. I was not very happy with it. I thought that the Jaguars kind of came into the draft with, you know, a quite a bit of needs that they needed to fill. And there were some number one best players available at those positions of needs as to where C.J. Henderson was obviously the second best behind Akuda. Now, um, after, you know, reminiscing in it and sitting in it a while, um, I came around to C.J. Henderson pick just like you. I think he, you know, the fact that he's the second best corner to Jeffrey Akuda, who Akuda is a excellent, excellent prospect. And, I wanted him so bad. I wanted Akuda so freaking bad. Just watching him, he has literally – like his, those are the two prospects that, you know, really resonate with uh, – Jalen Ramsey the most. They're both long, lanky, you know, quarterbacks with long arms, very fast. You know, they're not afraid to, you know, hit you hard. And they're, like, they're like safeties but playing as a cornerback and with good zone awareness and good man awareness. Super solid prospects. I didn't view – I didn't really want C.J. Henderson. I was kind of looking for a wide receiver. I was thinking maybe C.J. Henderson might have fallen, but now looking back at it, I think that we got him at a really good, you know, selection. Wanted Jerry Judy at a number nine when he was still there. Wanted him really bad because – just watching him, he's just so electric. But, you know, I'm not going to be mad about the C.J. Henderson pick. I really like him now. I think he's going to produce. So, really looking forward to that. So, going back to talking about how, you know, we initially fell after the selection of C.J. Henderson, and um, it wasn't just us. You know, you look all over Twitter and fans' reactions to C.J. Henderson pick, and a lot of them did come around, and it became kind of a topic of discussion. Why do you think that uh, fans were kind of brushing off the C.J. Henderson pick like it wasn't a good pick. Personally, just because I think people look into mock drafts a lot, and for like you, you hear people like doing the way too early mock drafts, like a week after the you know OTA start, and it's like, what are we gonna do next year? Like, where, where are we gonna pick and stuff like that? And I just remember, I think I remember I saw a couple um, mock drafts of C.J. Henderson coming in the second or third round, and then all of a sudden, after you know. Whenever, whenever he did his pro day and stuff like that, people were just like, okay, C.J. Henderson got to be, you know, a top, a top 20, top 25 pick. And then we're picking him so early in the first round, we could have maybe gotten him in the second round. But now looking back on it, he allowed zero touchdown, or I think maybe one touchdown, and it wasn't even his fault. It was a, it was a, um, a mistake on the safety's part 
when he was, I think it was cover three, cover two, something like that. And when, when, in, that, in that cover two, the quarterback plays the bubble above and the safety comes over the top to make sure they don't, there's no top routes. And so that's basically what his route was. I think I could be wrong, but I think that's what it was. And it wasn't even his fault. So theoretically allowed zero touchdowns against top SEC. No, you know what? It was in the LSU game. I think it was against either Justin, Jeff, uh, Justin Jefferson or um, Jamar Chase is when he let that touchdown up. I think that's, I think that was the game that I'm thinking of now. It was either, like I said, cover two, cover three. And I just remember, like, we beat him a little bit barely on the, on that route. I, I don't remember the route, but I think that's why people don't like him. And now people are coming around and seeing, like, okay, he's actually a lockdown cornerback. Like, he will lock you now. And for the most part during that game, I remember him. Like, Joe Burrow was having problems. Joe Burrow and the LSU Tigers pretty much went through every single team that they went against by more than 20, 30 points. And coming to the Gators and, and you know, like where they're at and Kyle Trask and stuff like that, they, they scored on us. They scored on us big time. And the defense was shutting us down. That was like one of the only games the entire year we didn't score, you know, 50 points. Mm-hmm. So looking back at it, CJ Henderson looks like a really solid pick. It looks like a really solid prospect. And I'm, I'm actually really happy about it. But I think because the mock drafts and people reading into that and actually doing their, you know, their homework on him is the reason why they think that he's going to bust, but I really think he's not. I don't think he's going to bust whatsoever. I think CJ Henderson is going to be a part of this team for the next 10 years. If, if we play the way we we need to play and our coaches aren't like complete assholes, like freaking Tom Coughlin getting freaking Jalen Ramsey off the team, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But if we do it right, I think CJ Henderson is going to be a part of our long-term plans and be a building block for our defense. Um, yeah, and then the number 20 overall pick was one of the picks in my mock draft that actually got right. I didn't see a lot of people uh, projecting this pick, but Clavon Chase on, and I think he's a dog. And I think especially coming into this new defensive scheme that the Jaguars are intending to run in uh, 2020, I think he's going to be a big part of the defense, maybe even bigger than C.J. Henderson. Uh, what do you think, Jason? I think we could have gotten him in the second round. Personally, I think that he would have been there in the second round. Um, you could have maybe even traded up for him, but I think the culture were like, you know, like sniping us, it's like hardcore. Like, there was teams sniping us left and right, like just draft, or trading up to draft the players that we wanted to draft. But at 20, I don't, really, I don't really mind it, honestly. I'm a huge LSU guy. I love LSU. I've loved LSU since 2007. I love Clavion Chason. I love him. I love, love, love him. And if we're not going to – if if there's there's two parts of the spectrum that we can speak on right now, whether Yannick Ngakwe is going to come back, whether he's not. If Ngakwe doesn't come back, Clavion slips right in there in his role and I think produces maybe not at the very same level as Yannick did in his first year, but I think he's going to have similar stats his first year than he did in his college in his last year. Five and a half, six sacks, I'm, I'm projecting for him to be if he's a starter and plays over 900 snaps. But personally, I like Clavion. I loved him when he was a college he's a dog he can do he can drop back in pass coverage he can rush the passer he can do whatever you need to do I don't I think his weaknesses are stopping the run because he is so small he plays like a, a like an outside he's obviously an outside linebacker and that's how they played him at LSU they barely played him in, in, in you know three technique and a four technique but being being that small it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna have him he's gonna he has a strength to get around the edge to sack the quarterback and that's what we're really looking for because when you look at unique and Gakwe I think people don't want to pay him because he can't stop the run that well but you don't pay people hundreds of millions of dollars to stop the run. You pay them to sack the quarterback. That is what you are. That, that that's all we need you to do. All we need you to do is sack the quarterback. We have we have we're gonna have decent, you know, you know, run blocking or uh, run defense this year. I feel like, but with playing on chase on, he's. I just want him to sack the quarterback. That's all. That's all I need to do. If he stops the run occasionally, great. But love Flavio. I think it's going to be exciting, you know, having him around, and especially with the whole Yannick and Gakwe situation. That's clearly. Uh, going on right now him and Josh Allen I think are going to be uh, two very exciting uh, first round picks that the Jaguars made on the defense and this team is still kind of trying to build that defense and um, with the addition of CJ Henderson and Chase on and uh, you know other draft uh, other acquisitions through the offseason such as Joe Schober um, how does this defense um, fare in 2020 in your eyes with these key new additions you think they I feel like, like Troy Herndon has a has a proven year Trey Hunter has to prove it this year. He has to prove that he's worth to be on the team for the next few years. I'm not saying he has to be the best cornerback on the team. That's not going to happen. I don't think Trey Herndon has it in him to be like that. But he has to prove that he can be a somewhat solid and consistent number two cornerback behind C.J. Henderson because C.J. Henderson is going to start out 
he's going to start. He's going to be the number one. He's going to be on the number one receiver at all, all times. All times. Trey Hunter has to do that. I think that's our only weakness besides our free safety and strong safety. We actually drafted a safety out of Auburn, Daniel Thomas. Watching him, he – this is going to sound crazy. You know, this is, this is a bull take from the last episode. He looks a lot like Earl Thomas to me. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying he's going to come out the gate in the next couple of years and beat Earl Thomas, but if we slowly develop him, I think Daniel Thomas has the ability to be a starter on offense, or offense defense this year, maybe even next year, just depending on what Jared Wilson produces in you know, OTAs, minicamp, and the preseason. It's really going to be a, tri- a trial and error period for him. But Daniel Thomas, I love that pick. I-, I love that pick. I watched him in Auburn. I watched him, all the picks that you know, extensively the Jaguars made. Daniel Thomas is one of my favorite picks of the draft. I think he's amazing. He, he let, he, there was poor coaching on the defense in Auburn, and that's why they kind of faltered this year. But you know, I'm not saying Todd Wash is you know, some god or some saint. No, he's, he's by far that. But I think that the defense that they're going to play, I think we're, I think we're both in agree they're going to play more of a 3-4 three, three, hybrid if Yanni comes back and stuff like that. I just – I love the Daniel Thomas pick. I think that he will start from week one. I think you, you won't have a choice because I don't think Jared Wilson is a very strong free safety. And I think Ronnie Harrison has a lot of growing to do. Other than that, it's really up to our cornerbacks. I think Jill Schobert, um, it, I don't know if anyone watches or, or listens to um, Lock on Jaguars, but Tony Wiggins summed it up very perfectly. They said that the signing from Joe Schobert, when they did the, lock, when they did the crossover series to the Cleveland Browns, everyone loved him. When he did the crossover series to the Ravens, the Ravens wanted Joe Schobert. That's a championship caliber defense. And if you want another player from the Browns like that, and a, and a championship caliber defense wants that player, that player has to have some meaning. And watching Joe Schobert, his only weakness is the run. But he can set other players up for success. He's very good at setting the defense, very good at setting everyone and putting them where they need to go. And Tony made a really good point by saying that. And watching Joe Schobert, he had a couple of games where he had double picks, just off tips and being in the right place at the right time. So I don't, I'm not expecting him to have four interceptions this year. That's a that's a very high number for him. But if he can put our defense in the right place, I think our defense will be pretty average of the pack, middle of the pack. You know, we might have some good games where we have good defense, but we have to stay healthy. We have to stay consistent. Joe Schubert has to be at the eyes and ears of the defensive coordinator and has to make sure everyone's in the right place at the right time, making the right call out, the right audibles that needs to be. I love this defense. I don't think it's going to be a number five defense like we were a couple of years ago in 2017. But I do think this defense has a lot to look forward to. I think this defense could be very productive. But on the low end, it could be very bad. It really just depends on, you know, the output of all of our team and whether Yannick and Gakwe comes back. There's going to be a lot of youth on this defense and a ton of talent that, you know, is yet to be recognized. Now, another thing in the draft was that a lot of people that wanted Jerry Judy, for example, in the first round were talking about how Gardner Minshew isn't going to be set up to, be, to succeed. You know, he's not going to be able to have these targets. You guys aren't helping Gardner Minshew. The Jaguars answer that by drafting Colorado receiver LaVishka Chanel, and they draft a wide receiver out of Texas, Colin Johnson, and I believe the – it's not John. Oh. Love Colin Johnson. I absolutely love him. I'm going, I'm going, I was so weirded out when you did that because I was like, you don't like Colin Johnson? I was like, no, what do you I mean? love this guy. And there are so many people comparing him to Calvin Johnson. So he has the last names and the height and the arms and stuff like that. He's not quite as fast as Calvin Johnson. I'm going to bring back another LSU game. Week one of the uh, college football season. LSU, or week two. Week two of the college football season. LSU played uh, Texas. They had we, – we, we had just brought in Derek Stingley, the, the number one overall quarterback prospect, and in a couple of years he might be top three selection. He's, I'm projecting him to be better than Dalen Ramsey. Derek Stingley Jr., if you haven't heard of him, listen to him next season because he's going to be intercepting left and right. But we had to put a, a, a freshman on a senior, Colin Johnson, who's like I think six foot four, six foot five. Derek Stingley is like six, six foot six one having to guard him, and he, he was the best cornerback in the country last season and was having trouble guarding this guy. Colin Johnson is an, is an absolute nightmare for defenses. Getting him in the freaking, like, fifth round blows my mind. I thought he was going to go in the fourth, early, maybe late third. Having him in the fifth was a steal. It was absolutely a absolute steal. I love Colin Johnson. To get back on the Lubitschka and Chenault, also a great selection. He is going to – I think he's going to fill in as our 
maybe number two, number three receiver. I don't know if he's going to be in the slot because we already have a slot guy in D.D. Westbrook. Playing D.D. Westbrook on the outside is – that's terrible. You can't do that. He's not an outside threat. He's not – he has the speed to be outside, but he doesn't have the height or the strength. He needs to be on the inside. So having LaVishka Sonal, he's like a running back as a wide receiver. It's, it's kind of crazy. You can play him at, you know, an H-back or you can put him on the, in a slot, or you can put him on the side. He does whatever you need. And he had, I think he had the most broken tackles for a wide receiver last year, if I'm not mistaken. So that, that was a really brilliant selection. Um, I think you could have traded down and still got him, grabbed another selection maybe in the fifth or sixth. Um, but I love Lavishka. I'm not mad we took him in the second. I wouldn't have been mad to take him at number 20. A lot of people wouldn't have either. I think Lavishka is a very solid piece. We drafted really smart this draft. There's only a couple pieces that I really didn't like. Love that selection. One of my favorites as well. I said that too. I didn't like the Jags draft. On, I mean, a lot of people didn't like the Jags draft because they didn't pick, you know, the sexy selections, the big names. But I think they went out and did the most with what they could with their picks. And with the Colin Johnson pick and the LaVishka Chanel pick, um, I think that kind of silenced a lot of, you know, those fans that were saying they are going out there to give Gardner Minshew some help. And you got to look on the backside too. Gardner has built some chemistry with these wide receivers that he has now. I mean, DJ Chark, a thousand yard receiver, you know, whether you want to blame Bortles in his first year or not, the turnaround that DJ Chark really had from last year to 2020. I mean, that was an incredible, incredible turnaround. And, you know, I saw it coming from a mile away, buddy. I already, I knew DJ Chark. Cause I watched him in LSU. I'm an LSU fiend. Well, I know every single prospect. I know every single per- team that they're on. I know if they're going to do good or not. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a, you know, like a psychic, but I knew DJ Shark was going to bounce, bounce back. And, you know, I, I predicted him in the last video we did to, uh, when we were talking about the last draft, predicting him to have 800, 900 yards. And I was like, he did more than that. Yeah. And it was partly just because there was no one else to really go to. DJ Shark was very inconsistent. Chris Conley, I feel like Chris Conley did, out, out, you know, outdid his expectations. I wasn't expecting a whole lot from uh, Chris Conley at the start of the season. I think Chris Conley is going to have a good season this year. I think if I think he's going to have a very good season. I think he's going to be our number two receiver on the outside. If we have a lot more, uh, you know, outside presence with our receivers, I think he'll be our number two. Um, I, I, I think that's a very you know, formidable spot for him. But there's always room for to be overtaken. He could have a bad preseason, a bad OTAs. I like Chris Conley a lot. I think we also drafted a tight end, uh, Tyler uh, Tyler Davis out of. Um, uh, Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. Everyone loved that selection. I don't love it so much. I want to see a little bit more from him. I'm not too sure about him yet. I have to do. I have to. I, I'm gonna have to go over over his games and what what he did in the in the games against good competition because anyone can have a, a good game against FCS opponents. But when it comes to the big games, I want to see what he really did there. His blocking because blocking is gonna be very important. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of what I was getting at there. I mean, you got guys like Dee Dee Westbrook, Chris Conley. Um, that are producing these numbers. Keelan Cole, even like towards the later end of the season, Keelan Cole started to Love kind of kind of stride a little bit. And you're adding guys like Lavishka Schnoll and Colin Johnson to an already pretty deep, good chemistry with Gardner Minshew. And I think that that is setting Gardner Minshew up to succeed when you add those two guys in later round draft picks that have a really high ceiling and a real high possibility to contribute and be a great part of this team. And with the tight ends to the addition of Tyler Eifert, I mean, and he, and you, a lot of people don't talk about it as much, but James O'Shaughnessy and Gardner Minshew, they build a chem, they built a chemistry. Like he was hitting him. He was being a security blanket and James O'Shaughnessy was as effective last year as he has been his whole entire NFL career. I think he was a solid, reliable go-to guy for Gardner Minshew. Now the same question I asked about the defense, I'll ask the offense. Um, What do you, what are your expectations with the additions through the draft, how they're going to contribute to this offense? They did not draft enough O-line help for Gardner Minshew. They really didn't. Cam Robinson, very inconsistent last year, but they always say that it takes a year or two to come off of an ACL injury. That's what he had a couple years ago. And I think the 2018 season, he had, a, I think, like week one, week two. I don't remember what tweak it was, honestly. Had a bad ACL tear, I think, his ACL or something like that. And it uh, takes a couple years for that to rebound. So if, you know, Cam doesn't, produce this year if he does not do that I don't think he's on the team next year um let's go let's go over the whole line I guess uh, Andrew Norwell paid him all this money because Tom Coughlin was you know greedy and upset that he got an offer from the Giants and you know wanted to be you know fascistist and just 
Well, they restructured his contract too and gave him some incentives, and I think that that's gonna. I think that's gonna help Andrew Norwell play. I think uh, you know being able to restructure that contract that you know a lot of people know is a not a great one that the Jaguars handed out during the Tom Coughlin era. But I think giving him those incentives, restructuring it, I think it improves Norwell's play. And, you know, what you said with Cam Robinson is true. I think it's just another year off that injury to hopefully come through, become a better player. Jawan Taylor, I think, has potential to be a really, really good player at that right tackle yeah. position. Brandon Linder gets a little bit, you know, because of the penalties, I get that. But he doesn't let up sacks. Like, he's in there. Oh. He's in the trenches game you know, after that's game. crazy. I was looking at stat. Brandon Linder, I think, allowed one sack last year. I think over yeah. a, like a, a 1,100 snaps, he was one of the top guys in the entire league as a center who didn't let any sacks go. Penalties, I'll live with. As long as you protect our quarterback, make sure he's up and healthy. Make sure if he does go down, you're the first one there to pick him up. Make sure he's good. Make sure he's ready to go for the next play. Brandon Linder is a tough guy. Everyone sees him, and he's a funny guy on the cameras and stuff like that. But when it comes to, you know, like, talking to each other, communicating, he is the person who communicates. He makes sure the quarterback is on a swivel, his head is on a swivel. I remember I was reading a story about when Gardner Minshew came in to, I think, his first game, or when Nick Foles went down last year. Brendan Linder straight up said, yo, make sure you get your head out of your ass and really produce because we need it right now. Like, straight up. Like, he's not, he's not a, he's not a you know, laid-back kind of person. He's in your face, like, making sure that you're making the right calls and the right reads. And I remember Gardner Mitchell was talking about it. I think it was on a, on a show in Miami when he went talking about the Snickers chain, the, the hungriest player of the year. He got a Snickers chain for it. He's auctioning it off. And uh, he was just saying, like, oh, my God, like, this is the real deal. Like, I'm playing, you know, the future, you know, Super Bowl champions. And we did really good against them. Yeah. We did really good for what we had. We, the game plan wasn't around Gardner Minshew, it was around Nick Foles. So, um, the offense, yeah, Andrew Norwell has to produce this year. I think he's like 30, 31, 30, 29, something like that, around, the, around that age. The wrong side of 30 for a lineman. You have to produce this year. We need you to produce or this offense is going to sink. Right guard, I think we're going to have Ben Barth there. Um, a draft pick in the fourth round, I believe. First, uh, first pick in the fourth round, 116th pick. I was kind of, I kind of liked him, honestly. I, I, I like that he's a, a big, a big person. He's a, he's a big person. I don't, I don't think AJ Can is consistent enough to hold that right guard spot. I really don't. Um, they're, they're, they're thinking about putting Will Richardson at left tackle. I don't know how that's going to translate. He was normally a guard in the last couple of years when he, when he was on a team. So I don't know how that's going to work out. It'll be a depth for the left tackle position. Um, I, I, I really like Ben March for the right guards uh, position and uh, Jamon Taylor. I completely agree. Love that guy. Love him. He had a couple of uh, misplays last year, but that's a rookie. You know, rookie's going to make mistakes. His first year, give him time to develop. Give him time to do that. I remember watching him throw Max Crosby, one of the sensational defensive ends on the Oakland Raiders, the now Las Vegas Raiders, threw him. I mean, he threw him like 10 feet. Like, he was power rushing Jawan Taylor. Jawan Taylor just put his hands up into his and, and, and his shoulders and just threw him. And I was like, oh, my God, that is insane. That was literally crazy. Max Crosby is going to be a really good player for the, the Las Vegas Raiders. Love Dewan Taylor. We just have to make sure that, you know, the offensive coordinator is going to be making the right calls. Jay Gruden has to put him in positions to succeed. Other than that, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about it. Um, we have Mike Lennon as our yeah. second. second nope. I, I, don't know, I don't know why they did that, but I'm a big fan of Mike Lennon. Um, just think he got some, you know, bad stints, kind of like the Josh Rosen thing. Josh Rosen – I think he's a great quarterback. I think he just needs to be in the right system, but he's just not. He just keeps going to bad team, to bad team, to bad team, and it's just not helping this development at all. But that's just my opinion on the offensive line. I think the receivers are very deep. The running back group is very deep. I like Raquel Armstead a whole lot. I think he's going to produce as a secondary back. Um, other than that, Tyler Eifert, solid pickup. He's going to be good for the next year or two, for sure. I Starting starting tight end, just want to know what Josh Oliver's doing. I don't know what what are you, where are you? Like yeah, I don't you know, you know, every now and again, but I mean I, other than that, I don't really I ain't seen too much from him. But to I guess overall recap the NFL draft, um just a quick grade for you for the Jaguars twenty twenty NFL draft. E plus. E plus for sure. Um I, I I will say my favorite absolute pickup was Shaquille Quarterman out of Miami, the fourth pick, one hundred and fortieth pick. Um we got that from the trade from the Bears when we got when we sent Nick Foles there. And guys off our team, I love Nick Foles. I want him to succeed. I want him to throw 40 touchdowns next season, but not on our team. He's just 
not what we need, the way we're going, the way our offense is called. Love Shaquille Quarterman. I actually have a friend who covers the Miami Dolphins and covers the Miami Heat. She's actually a college student at the University of Miami. She has a Miami broad. He told me that Shaquille Quarterman, they have a bunch of really good talent at their linebacker spot, had a bad year last year, but he was by far during his bad season, was a great prospect. And had it not been for a low season for Miami, he'd be a second-round prospect easily. So having Shaquille Quarterman, he's actually uh, from Jacksonville. He played at Trinity High School. And uh, he's a, I'm telling you, he's a thumper. He will, he will knock you out of the game. That's how, that's how big he is. And I'm predicting him to take over Quincy Williams' spot. as he, um, I, I don't know what – I think Miles Jack is going weak side. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that I think Shaquille Quarterman will, if we do do a 3-4 uh, line, I think he'll be an inside linebacker next to Joe Schobert, but I think he will be definitely playing the run, and he's, he will stop the run. He is a big guy who can move very fast, not as fast as Selden Smith, but fast, and he will thump you, and he will he'll hurt you real bad. So I'm excited for Shaquille Quarterman. That's one of my favorite picks um, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the draft. Probably a steal in my eyes, but, yeah, that's just my personal opinion. I love Shaquille Quarterman and Daniel Thomas. And I am Colin Johnson. Those are my three, three, uh, three favorite picks. They're all picked four, five, five. Amazing. I love that pick. I would, I would give the Jaguars draft class a B. Um, I really like the later round selections. I think that's one thing Dave Caldwell does well. It's just, you know, not the greatest thing on how they handle their contracts. Obviously we know that, but you know, finding guys like Telvin Smith in the fifth round, I think he always tries and gets guys that, you know, with the later round value that end up producing pretty well. And uh, I thought he did another good job this year with those fourth round picks, the fifth round pick, and even getting LaVishka in the, you know, later on in the draft as well. Absolutely. Moving on to the next big release from the NFL, and that is the 2020 schedule for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, before we dive into the schedule, I want to ask you, will there be a 2020 football season? Yes. You think I do? I do think there will be a. I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up the. Uh, no, you're good. Flexible schedule. I don't know why I didn't pull that up. Um, I do think there will be a 2020 uh, thing. Uh, 2020 thing. 2020 uh, season. Absolutely think there will be. It'll probably just be like the soccer game that was just played a couple of days ago. No fans in the stadium. They were t- talking about adding virtual fans and fake noise, and I'm just like, that probably would be cool. You know, we've never experienced something like that. Um, so I think. Um, I think that'll be very fun to see. I think it'll get old after a couple games, but it pop, it's going to be something new that we don't already have. So I'm not too upset about it. I was talking about it the other day. I would honestly go insane and crazy if there wasn't a football season. Like, I mean, I could handle really baseball and basketball. I mean, I'd love to watch baseball right now. I could handle losing those. But, like, if there's no NFL season, I might actually go crazy. But the Jaguars 2020 season schedule was released, and my first thoughts on it were that the beginning of the season seems like, you know, the Jags have a good opportunity to win some games there, maybe snatch up some upsets, but the later parts of the season are tough. But I feel like they're tough opponents. They do come to Jacksonville, and especially with losing those two games in London, I think that'll benefit the Jags uh, more as well. Uh, what's your overall feelings on the schedule, Jason? I think we're going to go five and eleven, <laughs> at, at maybe 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 four and twelve, at the best. But personally, I just really don't think that we're going to fare well. In all honesty, this season, um, I end maybe seven and nine. Eight and eight. If we really hit a hot streak, I think that is the top end of the projection. And I, you know, I try not to be negative. I try. I try to give every positive for the Jaguars and stuff like that. And last season, you know, I thought Nick Foles was going to take off, but obviously he was derailed by that terrible clavicle injury. You know, I think that before that injury, I think he was going to be a lot better than he was when he came back. Because you know, when you have that clavicle injury, it just throws off your entire throwing motion. And I remember one of Chris Conley's best catches last year was a was a. Um, was a ball that Nick Foles was delivering to him. And uh, I think it was during the uh, Falcons game. I could be wrong. It's so one of the first games back, and he, he, he had kind of – he, had a, he like, sidearmed it, sidearmed it, and it kind of lofted it up between three defenders. And Chris Conley, you know, tall ass, went up and grabbed it with his 40-inch vertical. And I was just like, why would Nick Foles throw like that? Yeah. You know, why would, he, why would he throw that way? He had, had no pressure in his face. Kind of just sidearmed it. I, don't, it. I think it just really messed up his throwing motion. You know, he, 
I don't, I'm not going to say he was rushed back because he was cleared to play a week or two before he was, uh, you know, because they, they um, put him on this uh, list, the disabled list or not, yeah. not the pup list, the pup, the physically unable to play list. And uh, you can't come back for, I think, eight weeks. So I think it was like week nine, week 10 was when he came back. And uh, it looked the same as when he did in the preseason. He looked really good in the preseason, I thought. He played very minimal in the preseason. But this season, I just – I just don't I – don't, I don't think they're going to do very well. I, I like Gardner Minshew. I think he's going to be a good quarterback this season. But we really don't know. You know, we really only showed, we only saw what, you know, teams didn't understand about him. And they played to what they thought they were supposed to do. And they were outsmarted because Gardner Minshew, Gardner Minshew is a, you know, a coach with a, you know, with a smaller body than what he should have. You know, traditional quarterbacks like Gardner Minshew. I, if he, he does well this season. If he is, puts the team on his shoulders like he did last season, I think it'll be – seven and nine, eight and eight top, but odds are everyone's looking down on him. I think that, you know, the worst we could do is probably three and 13 coming off the top selection of next year. And honestly, if Gardner Mitchell doesn't produce this year, we go three and 13, we already know who we're going to select. Either going to be Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields, maybe even Trey Lance, depending on how good Trey Lance does. Um, I don't know, man. I, I really, really want them to do good, but looks like they're not going to. They have, you know, Colts, Tennessee Titans, Miami Dolphins, Cincinnati Bengals, two who just drafted two quarterbacks and uh, two who have new quarterbacks, kind of. You have the Colts who just picked up Phillip Rivers, and you have the Tennessee Titans who just signed – I don't know why they've been signing him over Derrick Henry, but they just signed uh, Ryan Tannehill uh, over him. So you have four good quarterbacks in the mm-hmm. first four weeks. I think – if I don't think, I don't think Tua is going to play the first couple weeks. I think they're going to – see what Ryan Fitzpatrick can do. But odds are I think we go maybe one and one and three the first three weeks, the first four weeks. I don't I don't see us winning the Colts game. I don't see us winning the Titans game. I see us maybe coming out on top of Miami. Miami's a hard fighting team last year. No one wanted to play Miami. No one wanted to play them. They were they were a bad team, but no one wanted to play them because they're tough. They don't let you win very easily. And uh, I think Cincinnati, we definitely will may, maybe beat them. Um, and then Texas, I don't, I don't see it happen in the first five weeks. And I just don't see it happening, honestly. Titans or the Titans, uh, the Bengals would be a very tough opponent. They have a lot of good weapons on their team. They still have AJ Green. They still have, you know, Joe Mixon. They have a new quarterback, Joe Burrow. Never, everyone's saying he's the next Tom Brady. So you have to wait and see. I think we go one and three for three weeks, one and four five weeks. So that's just. <clears throat> what I like about the Jaguar schedule is I think the Jags kind of benefit from playing it divisional team um their divisional matchups early and I think having the week one and the week two matchup against Indianapolis and Tennessee are two solid matchups I think Indianapolis coming to Jacksonville uh Phillip Rivers you know who knows a lot of people the for this year I think the verdict is out for Phillip Rivers whether he's going to be really good or if he's gonna not fit so well with Indianapolis's offense we'll see um I like that. I like the first week matchup going to Tennessee is a little tough. And obviously week three um, going against Miami on a Thursday night game, which is the only primetime game that the Jaguars will have. What a surprise. They also have 14 1 PM Eastern kickoff games, which leads the league. And they are also the only team in the NFL that are not favored for any of their matchups. Jason, what's your opinion on all three of those things? I think that's, you know, like, I wash. I think. I think there's. We're gonna win some games next year. We're not gonna go in 16. It's not happening. I don't. I don't care. We're. I think. I think we have a good chance to beat the Chargers. Um, Packers are gonna be a tough team. Steelers are gonna be a tough team. Cleveland Browns. Everyone's saying they're going to the playoffs every year since Baker Mayfield was drafted a year and a half ago, two years ago. Everyone's saying they're gonna go to the playoffs, but they just they don't. You know, they're, there's terrible coaching, terrible positional coaches, hard team to beat because they always have. They always they have they have a good edge rusher. They have a good defense, you know, two really solid receivers. And we're not, we're even unsure if Odell is going to be on the team next year. Um, you get Minnesota. Minnesota's always doing good. Alvin Cook's a beast. Um, you have Tennessee Titans again. Um, Baltimore Ravens, no way that's we're going to beat them. I mean, we, we always could. We always, we always show up against those big, big teams most of the time. In the previous years, and you have the Chicago Bears. Nick Foles is just going to unleash his freaking wrath on us for letting us go. And then you have the Colts again, and I don't know. We'll see. I think there's maybe three to four wins, bare minimum here, that we could really pull off. And if we 
pull out those obvious three or four wins and we come close and maybe beat a couple teams, really fight for those wins. Could be looking at a six to eight win team. Um, I don't see us winning more than eight games. I really don't. I don't think it's possible. I mean, anything's possible on a Sunday, but eight wins, I just – I mean, do you agree? Like, where do, where do you see us? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm on the same end for that. I think that the Jaguars, as of right now, you can't really say that they're in for a season where they're going to go above 500. I think that's just too risky to say. You can't go on record and really have an opportunity to, like, actually – press for that reason to be correct I mean Gardner Minshew going six and six as a starter I'm the biggest Gardner Minshew fan in the building and you're gonna know that here in a little bit once we talk about our last two topics but I think realistically the floor for the Jaguars next season is three or four wins I think that that's the absolute floor I don't think that uh I don't think they go to, that's what I'm when we're gonna talk about this later I just don't want to spoil the segment I don't I don't think there's a way we go to three games I think four four is the floor and then seven or eight like you said almost exactly I'd say experience, yeah well that's crazy how last year it's like yeah we're gonna be like 10 wins you know like yeah. holy crap were we freaking wrong man that that was we had such an emotional roller coaster last year like I remember like third quarter of the Chiefs game I think like 20 40 20 to 40 thousand people were gone there was blue seats everywhere and that's just that's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible for the fans to do that. And it's terrible for the team to look like that on national TV. You know, everyone's watching the Chiefs game. Everyone's watching the Chiefs games. And everyone was saying, maybe we're going to be back in the playoffs like we were in 2017. We had the same defense from 2017 for the most part. Kelvin was not there. That's pretty much it. You know, we had Josh Allen, a top three selection. Everyone was saying he's going to go great. He had 18 and a half sacks coming out of college. He was robbed for fucking defensive rookie of the year. Yeah. He was robbed. He wasn't even in consideration. Gardner Minshew robbed. I don't see how that happened. That's a, that's a different topic. Um, but yeah, if we if we kept going on to the end of the season, that definitely would have been a a heated topic. So I definitely I definitely got <clears throat> really into that. Now I again I think floor for the Jaguars next year four wins, ceiling seven or eight, um, which is an average season. And hopefully, if the Jags do kind of come around to that seven eight game you know mark there are some players that you know you can build your team around because if this team is rebuilding and you get together a seven win season that tells me that there are some players and some investments they made that showed out and played well so guys like Joe Schobert Gardner Minshew another big one that we'll talk about later Leonard Fournette I mean, all these young targets that they acquired on offense, all these young players on defense, you know, people that the jury's still out for, like Ronnie Harrison, like seeing if Ronnie Harrison's going to have a good season, Trey Herndon, all these other, you know, factors. Taven Bryan, can he show up? I think if the Jags hit that seven to eight wins, then you see those, you know, smaller named guys that you don't talk about really step up and fill the void and uh, fill the role. But if the Jaguars don't win – those seven games they win towards the edge of two to four games that's going to put the Jaguars in a situation like you said for a top three pick now a big thing on Jaguar Facebook because you know Jaguar Facebook is probably the worst kind of Jaguar fan community I would say a lot of them are pro tank for Trevor that's the next topic that I want to discuss um first of all do you think that the Jags will tank for Trevor Lawrence? And do you even think it's possible? Because the Jaguars are a team that they couldn't even lose right, I feel like. I feel like if they needed to get the number one overall pick, it was week 17, and they just needed to lose, they'd win and they'd get the number two pick. What are your opinions on the tank for Trevor movement in Jacksonville? I don't, I don't know why you, you, would, you would bring in Tyler Eifert. I don't know why you'd bring in Dick Rudin, you know, um, I'm going to shout out again, Tony Wiggins uh, had a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago. We talked about the situation in which Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell are in. So they're in a very tight pinch right now. They have to do what's best for the longevity of the franchise, but they also have to do what's best for them now because Shad Khan has informed them to say, hey, this is your last year. You either make it or break it this season. We're going to give you every kind of, you know, we're going we're gonna to empower you to do what you need to do best for the franchise, but you have to come out on top. There is no exceptions for losing this season. Dot Khan is a terrible owner. I think everyone knows that. He's terrible. He doesn't know anything about football. His son, right there with him, he, he's a little bit smarter, a little bit more in the, more in the groove of it. I, I, li- I love Tony Khan. I love that he's a businessman, and I love that they're trying to do what's best with the video boards, the pools. That's all nice, but 
what are we going to win consistently? And that's where the conversation was with Doug Marone. I think Doug Marone is a solid coach. I like the day Gruden pickup. He, you know, had Andy Dalton look like he was fucking Peyton Manning for three, four years. Top, 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 top 10 offense. I think the entire year he was there. Jay Gruden went to Washington, didn't do great, but he wasn't the offensive coordinator there. He was the head coach. So having him come in, and then I think there was another coach that came in. It's so now the uh, quarterback's coach. I forget his name. I can't, I can't think of it right now. He's another coach that came in and is a uh, very solid, very solid offensive minded. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited for the offense, but you have to produce on both ends. You have to produce on both ends. There is no way you're going to be the coach next year. If you know, let's say they're, they're terrible and Dave Caldwell, I think might make a case if you know, you, you have some of your picks that you know are awesome. But if Doug Marone just flat out shits a goose egg, he's not there next year. And there's, there's no way around it. And I love Doug Marone. I think he's a coach that we can build around. But you're, you don't really have anyone to build around other than a good, a good rookie quarterback from last year that you picked in the sixth round who nobody really knew about, nobody really could coach around him. Or not coach around him, but you know, strategize around him. So it's, it's a very tough place to be in. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They have to do what's best for the longevity of the franchise. And they also have to do what will keep them their jobs going forward this year. So, and, I, and I think, too, that's uh, – by the way, Ben McAdoo. I, I had to think about ben that. I just, I just Googled that. Ben McAdoo gotcha. is what you're talking about. But, um, and that's why I think it makes it hard for the Jags to tank for Trevor because I think you play in a situation where the Jags win these two to three games. You're right. Doug Marone's gone. Dave Caldwell, too, probably gone. And that's not what's going to save these guys their job. I don't think the Jaguars are in a spot – where tanking is an option. I don't think they're in a spot where top five pick is an option. So I don't think, and I don't think the Jags have the team that is going to be that bad where it's a top five pick. You know, it's, it's exactly what you were saying, a rock in a hard place. So I don't think the Jags will have Trevor Lawrence next year. I think they're going to either do just bad enough to not get into that discussion or do every year. Yeah, or do just average enough to where Doug keeps his job, Dave keeps his job, and, you know, like I said earlier, those pieces continue to develop and the Jaguars have more of a built team around them for the future, which I would almost rather have that than to tank for Trevor Lawrence. And you, you, think, you think the hype around Joe Burrow this year was crazy? Just wait till next year. I think, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be one of the greatest quarterbacks to come out of the college. I don't know if he's going to produce like he did in college because in college – He's a, he's a monster. He's a monster. He can do anything you need him to do. He can throw a 60-yard bomb like freaking Patrick Mahomes. He can run for 30, 40 yards. I'm not saying he's fast as, you know, Lamar Jackson, but that boy got wheels on him. He's accurate. He's so smart, and he barely loses. He's not the quarterback that'll, that'll, that'll throw 40, 40, 50 touchdowns a year in, in the pros. But he'll do what you need to do to win. He'll make the throws that you need him to make. And Joe Burrow was crazy, but I think this year, if you think – Joe Burrow type was crazy because it is. I'm, and I'm the biggest Joe Burrow fan you'll ever meet. And I, I will follow him to his grave. I love him. I, I loved him last year when he wasn't so hot. But this year, you think Joe Burrow's type was real? Trevor Lawrence is going to be on a freaking crazy train to the number one overall pick. I, I, I'm willing to put hundreds of thousands of dollars saying that Trevor Lawrence, unless he is abysmal this year, and he could really just be terrible this year. He could be very average. And I promise you he's going to go number one overall. No matter how good Trey, Lawrence, Trey Lance does from North Dakota State University, no matter how good Justin Fields does, he is going to be the number one overall pick. And I think Justin Fields might be top two, top three pick, depending on um, Nai Sawal from Oregon. I don't know how to say his name, but he's going to be in the conversations of the top three as well. He's a great left tackle. I, I love that guy. I've watched him a ton. Um, I do think Justin Fields is right there next to Tre Trevor Lawrence, but I think Trevor Lawrence – he could just be average this year. And the hype around him will be around the same. But it, God forbid Trevor Lawrence does good this year. God forbid that. God forbid Clemson goes to the championship and wins it. God forbid that because I promise you, you're going to have freaking people with banners in Jacksonville and then, you know, Clemson in the Clemson area having banners, number one overall pick. And I promise you, Gardner Mitchell, you're going to see the draft in 2021 and you're going to see the, whoever team's on the clock, number one. It's going to say two minutes, and then on 159, it's going to switch to the pick is in, and you know what's going to come out? Trevor Lawrence is going to come out as the number one overall pick. Yeah, I'm so it's that, easy. it's that easy. It's almost kind of like an Andrew Luck feel. 
you know, when Andrew yep. Luck came out, that was, you know, the most sure thing deal. So I, I don't think the Jags will tank for Trevor Lawrence. I don't Absolutely think they not. can. And that's going to bring us on to the next topic of Gardner Minshew and if he can be, let's just say it, a franchise quarterback. If the Jags go in and win five games, it's going to be hard. You can still get – you can probably get a quarterback there if, you, if you're in a top five pick. I mean, not five games. But if you're in a top five pick situation, you can probably get another quarterback out of this next year's draft. But if you're outside of that, Gardner Minshew may be your quarterback for the next two years, next three years after that. Now, what are your overall feelings on Gardner Minshew and the uh, chance of him. him being the franchise? Love that guy. I love Gardner Minshew. He is the epitome of what Jacksonville is. Personally, love him. Do I like him as a future quarterback? Yeah, I do. I really do. I think that Gardner Mitchell is going to produce this year. Um, he's a coach. He's got a coach's mind. He loves he, – he's – I don't even know how to explain it to you. Like, and, 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 and if you're a Die fan and you're watching this, you already know how I'm feeling and how, why, why I like him so much. I'm sure people who are watching this and listening to this have the same feelings towards Gardner Minshew unless you just hate the guy for no reason. This guy is just – he lives and breathes football. There, I, I just, there's always a possibility that he could, you know, not be good and just turn into a coach at Alabama like he wanted to before he was recruited to Washington State under Mike Leach. I personally think it, he's it, there's just I don't I can't picture a scenario in which Gardner Minshew fails. If he fails in Jacksonville, he's going to succeed, succeed somewhere else. You know, Bill. You know, like last year, um, and I'll just I'll just say this. Um, if, if he does bad and we're, we're drafting the top five, I know that was the previous segment. No one knew who Joe Burrow was coming into this last year. No one knew who he was. Terrible. Pat was coming off of a finger injury. Got, got a new offensive coordinator. Joe Brady came in to LSU, lit it up. Amazing. Number one overall pick. He was projected to be undrafted or maybe in the sixth to seventh round. Went to the number one overall pick. <laughs> With the number one overall pick, nobody knew who he was. So there could be five, six quarterbacks next year who – Draft back to back to back. You know, I'm, that's obviously not going to probably happen, but you never know who's coming into this year with a you know the chip on his shoulder. And, Deb, and Joe Burrow had a chip on his shoulder. If Gardner Minshew doesn't do that, we're going to be in prime real estate. So yeah, personally, I think that you know Gardner Minshew is going to. He's. He, I think I just don't. I can't picture a scenario like I said before where you know he doesn't succeed anywhere he goes. He's just he has a, the brain of a coach. And when he reads the defenses, he knows what he knows where his first, second, third, fourth, fifth read is. However, whatever, he, he, he knows that there's going to be a lineman one day. He's going to fucking streak across the field. And that's not going to happen because it's an eligible receiver. But he knows where all of his options are going to be. He knows, he, he, he spots the, the uh, mismatches in the defense at all times. And that's what made him so good last year. And that's why I think going forward, you look at, you look at Justin Herbert. He couldn't do that before again. You look at, you know, other quarterbacks last year. A lot of them couldn't do that. A lot, a lot, a lot of the, a lot. Dwayne Haskins, I like him. I think he's going to be good next year. But last year, he couldn't read the defense very well. He was, he was confused because in college, you, you see maybe cover two, cover three, maybe a four-six defense. Sometimes you're like, okay, I have three receivers on the field. I'm in a great right offense. I'm gonna, I know exactly where I want to go every single time. They stare the receiver down. They're wide open because they're way faster than these, you know, lower tier teams. Easy touchdown. You, you have the arm strength to do it. But do you have the mind to do it? I think that's what Gardner Minshew has. He has the mind to do it. People saying that Gardner Minshew doesn't have an arm. I'll be damned. I saw him throw a 60, 60, 65 yard pass on a dime to Chris Conley in the Atlanta Falcons game. Maybe not that long. Maybe 65 is an exaggeration. He doesn't. He he, he has an arm. I don't. I don't. I don't know why people think he doesn't have an arm. That boy has an arm. And he's accurate too. On the run, he, he's basically the same as Blake Bortles when he's on the run. Blake Bortles can throw fucking dimes, <laughs> dimes on the run. Couldn't throw dimes in the pocket. Minshew can. Minshew can't throw dimes in the pocket. And that's what I like about him is that he has the mind of a coach, has the arm of whatever you need, whatever throw you need to have him. He's not, he's no Patrick Mahomes arm strength, but he can throw 60 yard passes in the air. It might not be a pretty one, but it's going to get there. It's going to be on the money every time. Well, there is a stat I've seen that, you know, it goes around Twitter. Like I feel like every two days almost Gardner was like the fifth most accurate quarterback in passes of 20 yards or more. Yep. And you brought up his football mind. And obviously, you know, he had an opportunity to kind of be a QB's coach or to learn how to coach under Nick Saban, at Alabama. 
and the rest is history from there. He also scored the highest out of anybody in his draft class at the Wonderlick test. His mind is incredible for the sport of football. And that's one thing that you see with these guys that have long tenured careers that stick around and you add on Gardner Minshew's personality that is so Jacksonville. And it makes me <laughs> so Jacksonville. Makes me so appalled because it was it was so Pullman when he cause like when he was in Washington State, which obviously is only fifteen minutes from where I'm at. He's so Pullman, Washington. Like, he goes in, he adapts to the community that he's in, and he's a leader. And when you watch him in college, in college he completed it's like 78 76% of his passes. Like, he knows exactly where to put him. He knows how to read defenses. It's incredible the football mind that Gardner Minshew has. And you want to see these guys that have out, outrageous, like, potential that can make big plays Patrick Mahomes no look passes Lamar Jackson he has the wheels you look at the greatest quarterbacks you know of all time and we talked about this kind of during the break with my roommate I mean you got guys like Tom Brady who Tom Brady wasn't a guy that had the insane ability to do anything terrific he was just wanted it every single day he was smart he knew how to read defenses and another thing that I don't get with people with Garner Minshew and why they don't like him is like this guy drops back to pass, and you don't have to hold your breath. He doesn't turn the ball over. He had a couple of fumbles. But, you know, when you're young, you're a six-round draft pick, your offensive line isn't holding up, you're going to fumble the football. That just happens. And he doesn't throw a lot of picks through six, eight picks this season. And he put Gardner Minshew's mind at it, and he put you know his ability to read the defenses to it. As a Jags fan, you should appreciate that. When has there been – even Mark Brunel, like, I mean, you go back, Brunel still – you know, there were some times he didn't make great decisions, but you don't have to fucking wait. Like, you don't have to worry. When Minshew throws the ball, it's either going to be in the vicinity of the receiver and just missed, or it's going to be caught. And, you know, you see that with quarterbacks that go up against the Jaguars where you, they drop back to pass, it's longer than two seconds, and you know when the ball leaves their hands, it's going to be completed. That's almost how it feels with Gardner Minshew. When he drops back, he has time. The ball's going to be fit in there. I think he has all the potential in the world – to be a future quarterback somewhere, and hopefully it's in Jacksonville because I think that's where he fits in the most and the coaches and the team are really buying into him. So, yes, I think Gardner Minshew is a franchise quarterback without a doubt. You made a fucking fantastic point, and that's probably the best point I've heard in a long time in regards to Gardner Minshew. When he drops back, you don't have to worry about it. You yeah. don't have to worry about it. He's going to make, a smart, he's going to make the smartest decision that any quarterback can, can make. You know, he, he might not have the arm talent as, you know, Mahomes. He, he might not be on the same level as Tom Brady in terms of, you know, knowing where, what defenses fit well. But he's pretty much there on Tom Brady's level. And, that, and that's saying something. And I know people are going to disagree with me, and that's fine. I don't care about that. All I care about right now is seeing what's going to happen year two of Minshew. Minshew, and the, these are the two spectrums he's going to lay on. He's going to either lay on as a very terrible quarterback next year, or he's going to be a fucking god. And this team is the team without you know if Josh was Dobbs starting, he scored very high on the Wonderlick test, but he's not going to bring us to the rocket seven scientists. Months. Though that shit ain't fair. Like I mean, Josh yeah, the rocket scientist. <laughs> but you put him as starting quarterback, or you put Blake Bortles back there. We're not winning as many games as Gardner Minshew is going to win for us next year. If, if if he is on the higher end of that spectrum, he's going to win us games by himself. He's going to win us games. Also, can we talk about Leonard Fournette a little bit? Yeah, okay. I kind of wanted to get, I kind of wanted to get into that too. But my my last point on Gardner Minshew is that it's so crazy how they like don't take that for granted. Like, do you remember when Blake Bortles would drop back? You would just hold your breath every oh my time. Gosh. With Minshew, you don't, worry. you don't worry at all. You just you no. know he's gonna go. And that's a great point. Yeah, you you really hit it on the head right there. You hit the nail on the head right there, honestly. But uh, what, what were you gonna say about Fournette? They don't want to extend Fournette, and I think that is absolutely ridiculous. He had one of the most receptions as a receiver. He was no Caffrey, but he had a lot of receptions last year. He had 60-plus catches. It was insane. And he didn't have a lot of yards per reception, but that's just due to – he didn't. Ha- he doesn't, he's never been known for having good eyesight and good eye vision. I think, you know, like he had more rushing yards than his, you know, in, in his 2017 rookie year. Had more rushing yards then. Had a, I think I think had a higher yards per carry. I think he had like a four point four yards per carry in his rookie season. He had a four point oh yards per carry. Didn't have as many receptions either. And everyone was looking at Fournette like, damn, he's a god. He's he's Jesus Christ reincarnated. But last year he ran for more yards, 
We didn't have the quarterback we did then. We had a better quarterback now and who, who's playing better than Blake Bortles, who we didn't have to rely on Fournette too much. And not, not until the end of the season, or not, not, not in the beginning of the season we kind of did, but in the end or, in a part of the season, we didn't have to rely on him that much. He was good last season. People are failing to realize that 60-plus receptions, 1,000 yards receiving, he had four touchdowns, but that's just because we didn't get really close to the goal line. And that's another play on Gardner Minshew being a good quarterback. So, I mean, there's times, you know, you see Minshew go through his progression, nothing's there. He throws it to Leonard Fournette. And Leonard Fournette, obviously, you know, a huge man. He can make plays, you know, off of just breaking tackles. And Minshew was able to get him that ball. And I released a tweet. Uh, well, I t- released a tweet. I tweeted, <laughs> I tweeted the other day about how appalled I was at the treatment of Leonard Fournette by John Wilder. Terrible. But I think from an NFL side of things, it makes sense. You look at the running back position today in the NFL, there's not a whole lot of running backs that you can say aren't expendable. I mean, you look at teams like the Chiefs and the Niners, for example. I mean, they didn't have running backs that were going to be high-paid guys. I mean, they were just getting the job done. And when you have an exception, you know, Leonard Fournette kind of walks that fine line. It's like, is this guy – franchise changing enough to be a guy that we pay all this money to and give a long-term contract to, or is he just a guy that is expendable at the end of the day? Because I mean, you see guys like Raquel Armstead who, when he got his opportunity, he played well. But if this year, if Minshew has a great season, I'm talking probably 3000 yards passing. He had that this year only. Plus, plus way more than that. Three, like 3,400. We'll put the bar like 30, I would still more than that. I think like 3,600 would be his, uh, uh, so his floor would probably be a 3,400, like you said. I think you're, like, trying to give him realistic expectations, but I really believe in this Jaguars offense. I know I said it in maybe earlier, but now that I'm thinking about Leonard Fournette this coming season, I think the reason they didn't offer him that contract is to see how good he'd be this season. Exactly. He's because, not going like, to be, sorry, not gonna be Adrian Peterson. I was, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So that's, like, that was kind of, like, my point is, like, if Gardner throws 3,600 yards – and, you know, 30 touchdowns, the interceptions are cut back, and he's really running this Jaguars offense. And, you know, Fournette's almost like just kind of like a better thing to have with this offense. I think that improves his value, especially if he gets over 1,000 yards. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm going to double back. I'm sorry I'm to cut you off. I know I've been talking a lot this entire podcast. No, you're good. Dude. I have a lot of opinions that we haven't talked about. We haven't got to talk about, so I'm trying to pull my whole brain in the spectrum. But I'm going to double back. And I'm going to say the Jaguars floor is six wins. I think I think that's a floor for them. I think their ceiling is still eight. But I just – this Jaguars offense, the addition of Tyler Eifert, I think with another year of learned for net, I think he's going to come out stronger. I think he's going to go back to the body he had when he was in his rookie season. I think the addition of, you know, like another, another tight end, Tyler Davis. We have a deep tight end group. We have a deep wide receiver group. Two great receivers. We have LaVishka Sonal, Colin Johnson. I know we're going back in segments and stuff, but I'm sorry about that. We're going to – I just – I cannot picture if I just can't picture Gardner Minshew having a bad season. I just can't. I just really can't. If he does, he does. I'm wrong. I'm okay with that. I will be roasted out of the stake for it. That's fine. Gardner Minshew looked like a good damn quarterback last year, and he was a rookie, and he was going in against tough teams with tough defenses. Had a bad game against the you know the Saints. That's a great defense. You're gonna have bad bad games against great defenses because you wanna know why? They're great defenses. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're great for a reason. We had so many good quarterbacks. 2017 and early 2018 when Tom Brady couldn't beat us. We were a bad team that year. He still couldn't beat us because we have a damn good defense. Defense wins games for you sometimes. And when you play against, a, you know, a, a Saints team who doesn't have Drew Brees, we're, put, we're fighting we're fighting Teddy Bridgewater for the win. He obviously clutches it out because everyone's giving up on each other. They're not, they're not fighting together as a team. And that's why we got out in the draft and got a bunch of character guys who, you know, strong-willed, want to win the game. Good, have been there for a year. They weren't, they weren't three-year players. They were four-year players for the most part. Got good players. They got good players in the draft. I just can't if, – if, I just don't see a, a scenario in which Gardner Minshew is bad. Like I said, I could be wrong. But I think with the, with the addition of Tyler Eifert, another year of Leonard Fournette, another year of Chris Conley, another year of Dee Westbrook, Keelan Cole is just somehow finding his fucking way on the team every year and producing. After his, after his rookie season, he didn't produce very well. He just kept falling on the depth chart. He might not be good in practice. But he's damn good on the field. Yeah, he's damn good on the field. He gets open. I don't know how he does it because he's not the the, the crispest route runner. But he gets open and he scores. I just we have the deepest wide receiver group in the entire NFL. I feel like maybe not nothing the best, 
but the deepest because we have so many players who can produce on so many different levels. We have so much different character and so much different abilities on our wide receiver group. It really just comes down to our offensive line. I think I think Cam will have a good this year, year this year. I want him to. We'll see. This is his, this is his uh, a year, a year and a half, two years off from his ACL injury. This is when he's supposed to be prime time, Cam Robinson. Dewan Taylor, like you said earlier, he looks great. He looks phenomenal. He might be, a, he might be, I'm not saying he's going to be, you know, Tony Baselli by any means, but he's going to be on that, you know, like close. He's going to be close. He's not going to be a Hall of Famer, I don't think, not, not, not in the first couple of years, but he's going to be solid. He's a, he's a good building block around the, uh, around the uh, offense. Brandon Leonard's getting old, but this is his prime time. This is 27, 28 years old. This is his prime time. This is when he's really going to show his worth to the team. I don't give a shit about the flags. Flags are going to come no matter what. Just tone it down a little bit. You'll be solid. You'll be a top center in the entire NFL. He's being paid like one. I think he's, I think he's being paid what he's worth. People don't agree with that. But Andrew Norwell is my main focus here. And Ben Barch. If, he, if Ben Barch comes in, I think he's going to be solid. He's really good in, in college. Played against top tier teams. You know, FCS teams don't really face, you know, good teams all the time. But that team did. They played a couple good teams. A couple good pass rushers held, held his own. I think he's going to slide, slide into the right guard. And I think he's going to be solid. So it really just comes down to our offensive line. And if our offensive line can give fucking Gardner Minshew five seconds, please, God, just give him five seconds because any other team can do that. Give him five seconds. We're going to win, I think, minimum six games. I, I, I know I said three to four earlier, but now that I'm thinking about it, Leonard Fournette's going to produce this year. This Colin is going to produce this year. If Colin Johnson makes the field at the end of the season because we're doing bad, he's going to produce. I just don't think we're going to be three to four win team if we are. Sucks. Another year being a Dax fan. So what? You've been there through all these years. Might as well be there for the next few years. If we have a 2020 season, we're going to have six wins minimum. I know it's crazy to say that. Eight wins is still our maximum, in my opinion. I don't see a lot of wins on the on the schedule. It's a lot of hard fought wins, but I feel like we have the grit and the you know the animosity towards other teams to sit there and really compete. That's probably crazy to say. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's another Jack. Another another day of being a Dax fan heartbreaking but it's so exciting at the same time you know i can't imagine being a chiefs fan and i know i'm talking a lot but being a chiefs fan is, is probably so fun right now but being a patriots fan was probably so damn boring compared to what the jaguars do every year it sucks we lose all the time but it's just like we're in all these games we're in all these games we could have been a 7-1 team last year we really could have even with Nick Bowles starting we were in a lot of those games we fought for a lot of those games and we won of the games that we won we fought for we fought we weren't a team that we're just okay. like go ahead go ahead i know you want to talk go ahead go no ahead. no i was just i was just when you were talking about how we were all in all those games last year i just it got me like bad war flashbacks from fucking uh when we played houston and oh my god i can't believe we didn't get it in the hands of garden that pissed me off so oh, much dude, i released a whole rant video after that i was i so watched sure. it i watched it yeah that 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 was and, and you're right i mean we're we're always even when we're like at the worst we're always, you know, involved in the games, and and I think that was a uh, that was a pretty good, passionate way to put an end to this podcast, Jason. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Any last words you want to say before you hop off? Um, yeah, I mean, just dialing down back to what I said before. You're in a lot of those games, you know, like I said, it, it's heartbreaking. But I, I couldn't imagine being a Patriots fan for the last 20 years. It's probably so fucking boring winning all those games. You know, it's fun while it lives, but there's always so much like you know question what's going on next, and it's like. Like drama at high school, it's like you don't want to be there, but if you're not in the drama, you're like, oh shit, there's a fight, you know, there's there's this, there's that, there's there's cheating, there's drugs in the in the bathroom. Like, oh my god, this is so crazy. And like, you get older, you're 20, 25 years old, you're like telling all these like fucking stories. Like, oh my god, there's people in the freaking there was ESE kids and then the special ed kids in the fucking one of the break rooms, of the teachers lounge, fucking smoking cigarettes. You're just like everyone's just like, oh my god, that's crazy. When you look back at the Patriots, like, oh yeah, they won a bunch of games. But you look back at the Jags, man, the season was terrible, and everyone's laughing and everyone's joking because it was fun. It was fun, and that's what, what, what being a Jags fan, it breaks your heart, but at the same time, it gives you a plus. Being a Jags fan isn't just like – it's like being a Patriots fan. It's not being like a Chiefs fan right now. Most, most of the people who are on that, you know, as fans for those teams, they're a bandwagon. It's hard to find a true Patriots fan unless you go to Boston or the surrounding areas. But you have people like you, you're in fucking bumfuck nowhere in Idaho or some bullshit or Boise or wherever the fuck you live. Not even north. Yeah, north. I'm eight hours away from Boise. You're a Jaguars fan because I just feel like you you watch a team, you watch a team build in the 90s with a great head coach, Tom Coughlin. 
you watch the team struggle after a couple of years. We go back to we hired Dak Del Rio. We're fucking in almost every game, every year. We're, we we got Byron Leftwich. Byron Leftwich gets derailed by David Garrard. David Garrard sums out fucking God. He's not the best quarterback in the NFL, but damn, he's a good quarterback. We fucking draft Rich Young Drew behind Fred Taylor. Fred Taylor's a god. He fucking rushes nine nine men rushes for 131 yards and Rich on Drew rushes 13, 13 uh, times for almost 140 yards, three touchdowns, two running backs. And it's like, holy crap, we have two Hall of Fame running backs on our team. And somehow we couldn't produce it. It's just like all these stories. And it's just like being a Jaguars fan is not just like being a fan for anyone else. And I'm sure other bottom dwelling teams can be like that because there's so much excitement that, you know, you're, you're, you're in OTAs, all the reporters, all the beat writers are saying, wow, this team looks really good, you know. They get the pads on, then they're looking bad, and then they have a good practice and a bad practice. And it's like an up and down roller coaster, and that's what makes theme park fun. Is you, if you have a roller coaster that just goes down all the time, you're just like, that's not fun. You want to have those loopy loops and stuff. That's what makes the thing fun. That's what being a Jaguars fan is. That's the, the epitome of what being a Jaguars fan is like. Is because you want them to do good. They break your heart, but then you fall in love with them again and again. It's like a toxic relationship that you can't get out of and you don't want to get out of. But it is amazing. And I'm just gonna end off on that. But that's what being a Jaguars fan is like. And it's so much fun. Even though it is so heartbreaking almost all the time, it is fun because you never know what's going to happen. No one predicted 2017. I promise you that. No one predicted. Everyone was looking at them like a 4-12 team. I remember the 2018 team, Colin Coward, listed us as the fourth best ranked team in the entire NFL above the likes of the Baltimore Ravens, above the likes of the, you know, the fucking the Chiefs. What happened? We fucking were terrible. So that's what it's like. And, it, and, it's, it's, and I know it doesn't make much sense to many people who aren't, you know, Long, lifetime lifetime fans, but God, being a Jaguars fan is amazing. And I love this team and I want them to do good. And that's basically all I really have to say. You know, like we basically summed it up. We're, I think we're over an hour now in the, in the podcast. And I'll if have, anyone's listening right now, <laughs> gosh, if anyone's listening at this point, and if, if you were brave enough to listen through all this shit that we talked about, kudos to you, man. You know, you know, Trevin is, is an amazing man. He's a, he's a great friend. I've known him for about six, seven years now. Please drop a like on his on his video. Please subscribe. I know a lot of the people who watch this aren't subscribed. Please subscribe. He's he's phenomenal. He's smart. He's dedicated to the cause. He's been a lifetime fan. Please please do that. He's awesome. And uh, that's all I really have to say. You know, I had a really good time doing this podcast. It's been too long, friend. I hope we do it soon. I uh, hope this becomes a regular thing again. And that's really all I have to say. Hopefully, hopefully I see you guys soon. And uh, have a good time. If you didn't get to this part, well then I can say anything I want to say right now. So. Dude, I mean, they miss. If they didn't make it to this part, they definitely missed out on like the best way to summarize how being a Jags fan is. Literally, and, and that's you know, okay. I might I might even chop that clip up and upload it on Instagram or something. I mean, that was that was put perfectly. But anyway, thank you, Jason, for being on the podcast. Thank you Absolutely. guys for listening. Uh, this is going to be a regularly occurring thing. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the dates are. It's it's hard with work for me because my weekends now are Monday, Tuesday, and everything else it just changes. You know when you go from a scheduled day off. But I promise y'all we're gonna have consistent uh, content out with me and Jason. Consistent content for me. Consistent crew cast. Everything's coming back full circle. Your boy's not a sad boy anymore. Thank you guys so much for listening to this Jaguars Week in Review podcast. If you haven't already, drop a like down below. Hit that subscribe button. Click the bell icon. If you're feeling real generous, you can go ahead and join the Treeps tribe and donate. Make sure you drop down below. You can like me on Facebook at Treep Talks. Follow me on Twitter at Treep Talks or follow me on Instagram at Trey Vaughn Pixley. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this podcast. You guys have a great rest of your day.